Let's move on to loop diuretics. Loop. Loop diuretics are going to be your main diuretic. I would star this one because it's going to be a major player in the diuretic arsenal that doctors have. So how do loop diuretics work? Well, first let's talk about the prototypical drug. The prototypical loop diuretic is going to be furosemide. When you think of a loop diuretic, you're going to use furosemide as kind of like your mainstay example. Um, so loop diuretics are also called also known as NKCC diuretics, and that simply stands for, well, they'll be NKCC inhibitors because an NKCC is going to be a transporter of sodium, potassium, NK, chloride times two ions. So we're going to move a sodium, we're going to move a potassium, and we're going to move two chlorides. It's going to be an NKCC transporter. So if we inhibit this, we aren't able to move these ions. So that's that's kind of the basics. So now let's let's actually look at the mechanism of action. And to do that, let's start with a new one because we'll need all the space we can get. We're gonna start with a typical cell in the kidney. Now where are we gonna see this? This will be in the uh, th this ascending thick loop. So the thick ascending loop. Because remember we have our glomerulus proximal convoluted descending loop of Henle, thick ascending. This is where we'll be acting. And we also have the distal convoluted and then the collecting duct. So we have the thick ascending segment. This is a cell that we're looking at. We're looking at a cell from the lumen and uh, from, the, from the nephron here. So here's our cell. Here's our lumen side. Here's going to be our interstitial. Here's our interstitial side. Um, I'm going to make my thing smaller. Okay, so we may also see it in the proximal convoluted tubule as well. We may also see it there. However, our main, this is going to be number one. So what do we have? Well, we have this transporter, like I said. And what it's going to do is it's going to take sodium, it's going to take potassium, and it's going to take two chlorides. And what it's going to do is it's going to move it into the cell. We're going to move these ions from the lumen and we're going to reabsorb it into the cell and from that cell it'll eventually make its way into the interstitial space. Interstitial space is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream so we reabsorb it. Stuff that stays in the lumen goes into the urine so if it stays in the lumen it'll eventually get uh, excreted in the urine. So we've also got another pump out here that's called the sodium potassium ATP Ace. And what this does is we're going to put a potassium inside the cell, we're going to pump out a sodium, and this is going to re require ATP. It's going to be an ATP ace. We're going to cleave uh, phosphate off of that ATP molecule, and in the process we're going to move a sodium out and a potassium in. So this is the sodium potassium pump. So looks like Potassium's moving into the cell, so or potassium's being actively moved into the cell. So somehow we got to get potassium balanced out, and that's through this channel. Potassium will leave through a channel. And this is going to be a, a a channel, so it's not going to require ATP. Then also we've got one more transporter over here, and it's going to be a symporter. What is a symporter? It's going to move two ions in the same direction, or two or three. This is a symporter as well. It's going to move three ions in the same direction. This is a symporter, and it's going to move two. We're going to move potassium outside the cell, and in the process, we'll drive the chloride. So we're actively pumping in chloride and pumping out sodium. The sodium is just going along it, along its gradient on this potassium is going along its gradient too because it's coming into the cell, it's being pumped into the cell and as such uh, as such it'll leave through a channel however potassium as you know likes to be inside the cell so it'll make its way back into the cell and once it's inside the cell it can also leave the cell through the symporter but why do we want it to leave it's because we can draw those chloride ions 
back into the bloodstream because we're bringing chloride ions from the lumen so that potassium is going to be a major player in this system. So hopefully you're kind of thinking, here's the NKCC pump, this pump that we just talked about dealing with loop diuretics because loop diuretics are also known as NKCC inhibitors. So where does this diuretic act? We're gonna block this pump. If we inhibit the NKCC pump, we're gonna have a loss of potentials. We'll still be bringing potassiums into the cell. Oops, not sure how that happened. Still gonna bring it into the cell. Uh, however, our net result will be we'll have more solutes in the lumen. This pump still works. This importer still works. This channel will still work. We're missing our pump. So we're pumping out sodium. We're pumping in potassium. Uh, we're not able to resorb as much stuff from the lumen, however. So all this stuff will be staying in the lumen. We're not able to bring it back into the cell. So our net result is going to be more solute in lumen. Well, what does that mean? More solute in the lumen means water will follow through its osmotic gradient. Uh, that'll be uh, the diuretic portion of it. So more water will go to the more solute side of the lumen. We will have diuresis. Uh, also of note, this potassium. So we've got a whole bunch of these cells kind of lined up with each other. Not just this one in existence. We've got a whole bunch of these cells. This potassium leaves through a potassium channel and this creates a positive charge. So all this potassium is positively charged. And we're gonna have a positively charged lumen. You're gonna have some other molecules here. You're gonna have some magnesiums. You're gonna have some calciums. Magnesiums and calciums, these are also positively charged. These will be divalent cations. Uh, what'll happen is when you have potassium leaking out, this causes a positive potential, this positive charge in the lumen. And what this will do is this will drive uh, the reabsorption of calcium and magnesium. And this will happen between the cells. It actually doesn't go through the cell. Um, so if you have a loop diuretic, you're gonna have uh, all these solutes in the um, all these solutes in the lumen. You're gonna have less potassium that can diffuse out to the cell. You're gonna get an impaired reabsorption of calcium and magnesium. So loop diuretics will also uh, increase the excretion of the positively charged divalent uh, cations. So calcium and magnesium. Okay, so why do we use uh, loop diuretics? What are some of the uses? Well, it's going to be a diuretic. I mean, it's in the name, diuretic. Everything that we're talking about is going to be used as a diuretic. However, this is going to be specifically, uh, you're going to use loop diuretics as a mainstay, not as, not as a number one option in the United States at least. Uh, however, it'll be used for chronic heart failure patients. If you hear chronic heart failure patients and they have high blood pressure, you're going to be thinking furosemide. You're going to be thinking loop diuretic. Also, if the patient has edema, thinking they have that hypertension, that's why you use diuretics if they have edema and hypertension, but also in heart failure patients. It'll decrease the workload of the heart uh, in heart failure patients. Um, there are some adverse effects adverse effects uh, you're going to see ototoxicity it's going to be toxic to the ear furosemide you're going to be monitoring uh, for ototoxicity and this typically occurs only in IVU so quickly administering furosemide uh, oral route typically is a slower uh, slower administration so you won't have as high of a risk for ototoxicity. Also, decreased sodium, decreased potassium uh, in the bloodstream, because remember here, we're getting rid of sodium. This stuff cannot get reabsorbed back into the cell. Um, 
that means that we're going to have an increased loss because everything that stays in the lumen gets lost in the urine. And if we can't reabsorb this sodium, if we can't reabsorb this potassium, this chloride, we're going to lose it in the urine. And that means we're going to have a decreased uh, sodium and potassium in the bloodstream, which leads to our decreased sodium and decreased potassium. So now let's move on to a different diuretic.